Hello and welcome to Moderate Fantasy Violence, a podcast about pop culture and the world around it. I'm Alistair. And I'm Nick. And in today's episode, we will be reviewing the new ghost hunting show from Simon Pegg and Nick Frost, Truth Seekers, and a new Greek mythology show from the makers of Castlevania, The Blood of Zeus. But before all of that, Nick, what have you been watching or reading recently? Well, I've continued to be watching a lot of Lucifer, but elsewhere in my quest for simple unchallenging tv that won't hurt my delicate soul i've also been going back and watching new girl the adorable flat share sitcom from the i think the early to mid 2010s featuring zoe deschanel moving in with a bunch of wacky men after her relationship falls apart and having embarrassing yet lovable antics with them and yeah it's very much what i wanted from it you know when i started watching it at the start of november i was bare to be distracted from reality and yeah it's silly but it more or less works i I remember when it came out there was quite a lot of push around i don't know how adorkable that's a word that was in vogue at the time isn't it (laughs) it was yes This, this was very much the adorkable show it was all about how adorkable zoe deschanel was adorkable 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 in the early episodes of season two and no one has yet said adorkable and it's fine it's banal and likable but it's quite funny and the the actors playing the three guys who are i think jake johnson lamorne morris and max greenfield are very very good it's it was kind of pushed as the zoe deschanel show i think maybe i don't know because because of how adorkable she is adorkable (laughs) but yeah it's pretty much just an ensemble flat share sitcom to be honest it's just the poor guys taking turns to be silly i'm kind of surprised it didn't take off more i mean it, it has the thing you sort of get in a lot of these shows where there's quite a lot of relatively big name guest stars or at least people you definitely recognize from playing major characters in other shows turning up in sort of bit part guest roles like in the first season you get like arrow from arrow turning up playing a love interest for someone and then in another episode, Nikki from Orange is the New Black, and also um, what's in it? Russian Doll turns up playing yet another random like three scene love interest. So yeah, it's quite fun in that sort of way. And yeah, everyone's clearly enjoyed themselves. It's a very nice, likable show. It is about as challenging as a fight with a bit of paper, but it is what it is. I'm quite enjoying it. I remember this came out, and there was a sort of a lot of fuss made about it at first. It seemed to like there was a big advertising campaign when it launched in the UK and things like that. But then it seemed to fade away quite quickly. But it- What I find interesting is it does seem to have remained of interest to people. There are still people who watch it, still people who seem to fondly remember it. I think putting the whole thing up on Netflix seems to have sparked a new wave of of interest in the show. So I find it, I don't know, interesting about the fact that it continues to have an appeal. Is it just because it's fun, likeable, you know, not particularly challenging comedy? Or is, is there more to it than that? I can't remember exactly where we were with the discourse around masculinity when this came out in, I've just looked it up now, 2011. But I think there's something quite weirdly now, considering it's nearly 10 years old, about the niceness and the non-threateningness and the relatively non-toxicness of the the three male leads on this show. It has not aged as badly as a lot of 10-year-old TV, I would imagine, probably has. Well, I mean, it's older than 10 years, but obviously a lot of people have pointed out, like, how problematic some of the friendships in Friends are and how the male characters are constantly trying to belittle the masculinity of each other so it sidesteps that i assume yeah i mean a lot of these hangout sitcoms tend to be quite broad they tend to go for a quite a broad kind of popularity which means they end up making quite often quite basic and turns out offensive jokes i mean i think that's what happened to friends in the end and that's what happened to big bang theory within about 20 minutes of it airing and yeah how about your mother i don't think gets nailed quite as much for being retrospectively offensive but it did of course have an ending so bad that it poisoned the entire nine seasons of the show mm. and new girl so far at least does not seem to have been tarred with any of those brushes and yeah i don't know it's a hangout sitcom but it's so far okay to just switch your brain off and watch i think probably that's what people are in the mood for this year so as well it's kind of chimed with people's desire for the maybe the less complicated past it's like it's before everything started to go to shit like around 2015 uh, yeah. a, a hangout sitcom remember when we could hang out <laughs> <laughs> exactly yeah yeah there's probably not a huge amount to say about it to be honest it is the adorkable hangout sitcom from the early to mid 2010s as you say by the time it ended it ran for seven seasons but i don't remember it having much momentum and he's certainly not in the sort of uk based perhaps slightly sci-fi fantasy based cultural circles i often run in maybe it'll run out of momentum who knows i mean they are already having to work a bit to keep the various will they won't they couples apart and i'm, I'm only in early season two so who knows how annoying that'll be by the 
the time I get to season six or something. So that's always a uh, a danger of these sitcoms that you, if you know where it's going, it just becomes like a matter of treading water for for very long periods of time. For some reason, the sort of glacial time frames that American sitcoms are set over for some reason. Yeah, these very long twenty two episode seasons where every episode has to feel like it moves the relationship forward a tiny bit, but also in a way that sets it back so that the show can last for another five years. Yeah, I don't know. It's fun to watch every day for the comedy, but yeah, I, I can see how the sort of ongoing storylines might eventually get tiring. Anyway, yep, yeah, so that was adorable. As the, what have you been watching? <laughs> so I've revisited a, a sci-fi film that came out last year, and it caused sort of like a bit of a splash amongst, I guess, people who follow art house or kind of independent sci-fi films. So it was, I guess, a sci-fi film that wasn't like a big blockbuster sci-fi film, a British one, called Little Joe. It's available on the BFI iPlayer. Uh, which is where I watched it. It's a really interesting film. It's set in this lab where the scientists have created a plant that if you inhale the scent of the plant, it makes you happy. Not in a sort of delirious, like, stoned way. It just increases your general kind of balance of mood into a sort of rosy contentness. But in order to control the plant, they've made it infertile so it can't breathe. And then over time, people sort of postulate the idea that the plant is manipulating people through the spores they're inhaling in order to preserve it and make more of it as it's sort of strategy for reproduction. What makes the film very interesting is that it never one way or another says if the plant is like manipulating people and it kind of gets creepier as it goes along and sort of strange things happening and it's one of those ones you can never tell is it real is the plant manipulating people's minds or is it just sort of a sense of paranoia that's built up in the small group of people is it there's also the various weird things that happen they could all be coincidences there are sort of like alternative explanations offered at various different points but at the same time or they could all be connected and there's this building sense of tension throughout sort of rising creepiness it's got excellent music really sort of weird production design with lots of like really like bright vivid colors which kind of make the whole thing seem a bit odd so it's just this real undercurrent of oddness running through it but I I thought it was absolutely brilliant and I really liked the ambiguity of the film yeah I've never heard of this one at all when was this released Uh, it was released last year Uh, it was at the London Film Festival last year it was one of the films I wanted to see at, at last year's London Film Festival but didn't get the opportunity to see I don't know, it wasn't like a hugely high profile film. I guess amongst people who follow art house or independent cinema, it was the film of the week everyone was talking about. It was like the top review on the Truth and Movies podcast. I think there was an episode of the Radio 4 film show about it. In the kind of alternative media environment of non-blockbuster films, this had its sort of moment in the sun. Okay, no, it's somehow skipped past my window about entirely. Apparently I'm not that down with the sci-fi fantasy scene. I seem to remember like... When it was advertised at the time, I think I saw like a trailer in the cinema, they were really trying to make it look like a horror film. I can imagine the distributors were like, no, this film's good. It's interesting. It's got relatively high profile cast. It's got Emily Beecham, Ben Whishaw, a few other well-known faces in it. But then I think the whole, it's just a kind of hard to describe. It's sort of, it's a sci-fi film, but the only sci-fi thing is really just this plant that kind of sits there. It's got some creepy bits going on, but it's not really a horror film. So I think they, the advertisers sort of forced it into this horror box as kind of like, this is a horror film. And then I think the kind of the public reaction was like, it's not that scary. <laughs> because it's not a horror film, really. It's just sort of creepy, weird sci-fi film. Oh, yeah. No, I do remember this. You're right. I thought it was a horror film. Yeah, Ben Whishaw wandering around the... Was it a mostly white background? Yeah, and there were these like, kind of really vivid splashes of colour, such as the red plants. Red, yeah, red plants, Ben Whishaw, white background. Yeah, no, I, I, was that not a horror film? Okay. Yeah, well, they tried really hard. I, I missed the name in, entirely when I was watching the trailers, but yeah, I remember a sort of white background, Ben Whishaw, red plants. We're going to show how effective that campaign was if you didn't remember the name of the film. It's a very much a crucial point. Was it not called... White room, Ben Whishaw, Red Plants? No? Okay. Sadly not. Yeah, I think they tried very hard to push it into this kind of horror-shaped box, which I think he was ultimately just going to disappoint horror fans. I mean, it depends what you, you want from your horror film. If you want something that's kind of, ooh, that's interesting and kind of creepy in a sort of weird cerebral way, but if you want to kind of like go to the cinema, you'll shit yourself with terror. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't deliver that. You'll shit blood with terror onto these plants okay fair enough so it was actually good then yeah i thought it was brilliant it's really interesting i kind of like the ambiguity of it there's some great performances from the emily beecham and ben wishaw i mean like everything about the film is like ambiguous and there's for example there's like the ben wishaw character kind of has a a sort of crush or or fancies the emily beecham character and they go for a drink after work 
at one point and after sort of a he finishes drink he kind of leans in to kiss her and someone like someone else in the pub just kind of steps in front of the camera just at that crucial moment in a kind of like it's done subtly so you can't really see her reaction so you don't really know if the kiss is welcome or not welcome you get the sense it's a bit awkward but you don't know if it's awkward in a kind of fumbling endearing cute way or an awkward as in unwanted attention way so everything about the film is very much on the ambiguous side nice yeah sounds Strange, but probably in a good way. Yeah, I thought this is really, really good. This is one of the um, best things that I've seen recently in terms of yes, the films we're watching at home. Kind of been using this period of extended lockdown to catch up on films that I missed in the cinema and, and things like that. So I signed up for a month of the BFI iPlayer to try and catch various art house and independent films that I missed at the time. Yeah, I've been watching my way through several things, but this really jumped out at me. It's been really, really good and really worth getting your hands on if you get a chance. Wikipedia is so confused. It's, it's described it as a drama film, which is... <laughs> this certain, is incredibly vague. Certain, certainly a word. It's like, this is a film that has some tension in it. <laughs> yes, stuff happens in this film. If that's not a recommendation, I don't know what it is. Okay, and first, this fortnight, we were talking about Truth Seekers, a new comedy, horror, drama, multi-genre extravaganza TV show from Amazon Prime, starring Nick Frost and Simon Pegg, alongside Emma Darcy and Samson Ko, and created by Pegg, Frost, James Serapenowitz and Nat Saunders. And this is about Gus, a broadband installation man and paranormal investigator, who hasn't had much luck with his paranormal investigations until he gets assigned his new partner Elton, full name Elton John, obviously. And suddenly he finally gets to find some actual ghosts and he soon finds himself drawn into a sinister conspiracy of paranormal stuff and surprisingly gory bloodletting. So yep, this is the full eight episode season. We have watched the whole thing. We might not need to spoil it. I don't know. We'll see how we go. I'm not planning on spoiling it immediately anyway. So yep, Alistair, what did you think? Yeah, so I I enjoyed watching this. I'm a big fan of the the Peg Frost combination all the way from, you know, the glory days of probably more than 15 years ago of Spaced and Shaun of the Dead. So yeah, I was very much on board for this. And I like the way they mash genres together, usually comedy and horror or comedy and sci-fi, as they've done in, in various things. And this time again, yeah, it's horror and comedy together. The approach they've gone is what I've seen described in the past relating to other works is yeah, what's described as ghost train, which is that there'll be like a, a horror thing that will make you jump, but then you'll usually laugh because of what's made you jump is actually quite ridiculous. So and I quite I'm quite down for that sense of humour. I think the thing that kind of did it best was there was a play in London called uh, Ghost Stories that did that really, really well. So I, I really like that humour, the way it can sort of create a sense of horror and also humour at the same time and have them work together. And there's also, even though of what is quite a funny show, there is quite a good sort of mystery and plot behind it. At first I thought, is this just going to be a sort of guy goes to this house and he's broadband installed, it turns out it's haunted. Guy goes to this house and he's broadband installed, it turns out it's haunted. But over time, this quite complex plot emerges, linking quite a lot of characters together they introduce and builds up to quite a quite tense finale. And I found myself actually really quite invested in the plot. So what I thought might be a bit of Ghost train fun ended up with something that I was quite into in the end. Yeah, but I've seen quite a lot of comedy dramas when they're done well. They're some of my favourite things. And this was a pretty decent one. They sort of, sometimes they sort of transcend the point of being both very, very funny and very exciting. Others sort of try for both, achieve neither and flop entirely. And this one, I think, found the sort of middle ground of doing a decent job of both. I'm not sure it's a work of genius, but it's very decent. Like, I'm, I enjoyed it fine. I, As you say, I got a lot more on board with it as I went along. It, of course, did a decent job of building out its mythology and getting momentum. And, like, it starts quite slowly and and then I think if anything, you're pleasantly surprised, or at least I was, don't mean to speak for you, listeners, when it turns out that they're taking the horror relatively seriously, which becomes apparent around episode two or three or so. But yeah, there's actually a, a reasonably dense sort of horror mythology going on here. And the comedy isn't so much that the horror is silly. The comedy is mostly sort of gentle sitcom-y stuff just to make you like the characters quickly. It's very nicely done. Like, Nick Frost is very, very likeable here. I think this is the first time I've seen him as a sort of solo lead. I'm sure he's done other things, I just haven't watched them. And he's, yeah, he's a good sort of 
anchoring presence. He hits the, the pathos quite well. He's obviously very funny. I guess if you're primarily here for Peg Frost nostalgia, Cyber Peg is not in it that much, and when he is, he's fairly sort of understated. Like, you sense a real effort to make the show primarily about the Nick Frost character's relationship with the other characters, rather than, like, putting the focus off them by giving them the old matey dynamic with Peg and making us want just more of that. So, you might be mildly disappointed if you're here primarily to get your Peg Frost fix, but I always like seeing them both, and there's they're both still mild spoilers, I guess, alive at the end. So there's still potential for some Peg Frost action next year. But yeah, I thought, considering that it was sold, at least to me, as a Peg Frost show, there wasn't that much Peg Frost, I was still pretty happy with it. Yeah, definitely this is the focus on Nick Frost, and I thought that was good. I mean, he's very funny, they build up the characters, and they spend a lot of time building up his relationship with the other two, the Elton John and Astrid. You know, they, they you kind of really believe in them as a sort of a unit and them, but then they kind of build it out and bring in, amazingly, Malcolm McDowell playing um, what you're led to believe is the Nick Frost character's father and also Susan Wakoma playing Helen Elton John's sister and they kind of form this found family kind of extended group that's quite sweet and you know there's sort of various different dynamics between the characters there's a quite touching friendship between Helen and Richard that kind of spans the generations the core kind of dynamics of the main characters is is where the heart of the show is and yeah you're right that the Simon Pegg Nick Frost dynamic is sort of put to one side which I think works well because we've had quite a lot of films and TV based around that dynamic I mean both of them sort of I think are sort of writing and creatively controlling the show so it's and it's definitely their sense of humor but one of the things that's good about this is how they're mixing it up it's not just they could have easily done another show about two friends played by nick frost and simon Pegg who investigate mysteries together but they decided to do something a little different with this and that works yeah i think as you say the wider cast works i thought the astrid character played by emma darcy is if anything maybe a bit underdeveloped i don't know she seems to get the least to do i guess maybe because she turns up a bit later than the others like she doesn't get a full debut until like episode three this is only an eight episode show that's like a quarter of the way through mm. so maybe it's just having less time but yeah i felt like to be honest i actually wouldn't have minded seeing longer run times on this there's a few of the episodes which feel slightly underbaked like they kind of just stop before anything really happened and you know Astrid especially could have got more developments I don't know I mean it's very it's very tightly done like the episodes are like between 25 and 30 minutes which is pretty short especially for in the streaming era it's one of those things where because it's on the the dramatic side of comedy drama I think like it's not necessarily trying that hard for the big big lols it's just sort of using this gentle comedy to make you like the characters so as a result it feels a bit weird but it's got this kind of sitcom runtime Hmm. I mean, I did like how tight it was and how there was very little wastage. I mean, we were just talking in our in our break, I suppose, about, you know, some Netflix shows are very long and have so much wastage in them. This was, yeah, the opposite. And uh, yeah, I was left in sometimes wanting more, which is better than, I guess, than wanting less. Where it comes to the Astrid character, I mean, there's a mystery around her that I won't spoil now, but I think it did quite a good job of building up that mystery, to, even to the point when there were definitely things being dropped in when I was like wait a minute and then like the puzzle was sort of starting to come together into my head before they revealed it and it made a lot of things make sense i'm deliberately being vague to not spoil it because i would recommend going into the show not without the spoils but yeah i thought that was very well done and quite subtly done with it they were able to sort of nod towards the mystery without being like hey hey mystery over here mystery over here <laughs> Yeah, for, for a show which I think you probably go into expecting it to be, again, kind of sitcom I think it does quite a good job of having these quite complicated mysteries and this quite dense mythology. I, I sort of expected it, it to be about bumbling idiots who are basically wrong, but no, as I say, we get into, like, horror is real quite early. It would be quite easy to make a version of this show which mocks Gus for being this sort of lives with his dad sad sack. The show is very empathetic, I think that's a word, towards its characters, and there's no snide mockery at their expense. Yeah, which I liked about it. In terms of like previous Peg Frost collaborations, it reminds me quite a lot of Shaun of the Dead in that it manages to mix together both horror and comedy. And I think that was one of the previous times that they achieved it very well in the sense that the the humour doesn't detract from how scary it is. They they never use humour or rarely use it to bring down the tension. They use humour to, as you say, to build the characters and to build our relationship with them. But they don't use it to deflate horror. And also the horror doesn't make the funny bits any less funny. They kind of sit quite comfortably alongside each other which is a difficult balancing act to do it's pretty much achieved by it's their kind of funny quite silly characters with their with foibles in what are quite serious situations involving possession ghosts of serial killers back from the dead things like that so i, I really enjoyed that that vibe because it's something i really much enjoyed in 
Shaw the Dead. There was also a kind of Doctor who ness to it, and it's a sort of yeah. low, low-budget low British sci-fi thing. It's got that kind of slight edge of silliness that Doctor Who has, but I guess the humour in this means that it's clearly telling us you're not supposed to take this 100% seriously when some Doctor Who does lurch into being painfully po-faced. But it does also, like Doctor Who, it builds up a lot with character and atmosphere when it can't rely on special effects like an American sci-fi show might. So... <laughs> Yeah, in a year when we had some disappointing Doctor Who, this is probably, the, in some ways, the best bit of Doctor Who we got this year. Yeah, it's, it's very likeable in that sort of, not self-deprecating exactly, but sort of scruffy underdog British TV vibe. Honestly, having watched a lot of slick US telly lately, like I say, I've been, you know, mainlining New Girl and Lucifer to get me through the pain of it all. And, you know, very, very sort of slick, formulaic, heavily sort of lubricated, heavily pared down shows which have a very this is a machine vibe going on in a weird way even though they are at least one of them is also about scruffy underdogs honestly it was almost almost a gear change watching some gentle british telly after all of that and it maybe took me an episode or so to get into the vibe but yeah it, it was nice to get back to some of that yeah it's definitely got that sort of british feel to it like i know what you mean by american shows because sometimes feel like they've been all the edges have been smoothed off it's just kind of they're so relentlessly technically competent that it's, it's a sort of bizarre kind of yeah, airbrush world of perfection existing where this slightly sort of yeah low budget and a british underdog yeah it's, it's very much a underdog show in that it's got less money and less famous people in it but but it succeeds well i mean by i don't know by amazon tv show standards maybe it's got two people who have been in films on it although maybe that's not as big a thing as it used to be in streaming tv now yeah i suppose it's probably still a bit of an underdog in the platform considering it's competing with like the boys and i think there's a do they have a show with julia roberts or did i make that up but yeah. They they did, yes. I thought as I say that, they clearly have actually probably thrown quite a lot of money at this, partly because the cast is phenomenal. Like famous people just keep cropping up. For famous British comedic people, but I still think they've got an absolutely phenomenal group of people together. We've mentioned Nick Frost, you know, Malcolm McDowell, people like that, but Julian Barrett turns up as a villain figure, you know, and he's excellent to do again, as a big fan of the Mighty Boosh and Mindhorn, you know, and uh, Nathan Barley, Julian Barrett's excellent. Kevin Elgin has a cameo appearance in one episode oh yeah i saw him <laughs> yeah the man who's always in the cameoing in like every great sitcom ever and sketch show but really gets to star kelly mcdonald as well so yeah they've got they've got a phenomenal cast in this show as well um it blows my mind they managed to get malcolm mcdowell who was a long and illustrious film career and also um the new additions to the to the cast so the less well-known people samson Keo and emma darcy are also really good and hold their own against yeah these very well established british comedian actors you know like julian barrow i mean yeah the new people are just as good as the famous people they get to crop up but i was continuing amazed by it, like how many famous people they managed to get into this oh yeah i think it helps that all the main cast were played by quite strong personalities especially as you say like susie wakoma as elton's sister helen and malcolm mcdowell as the dad they had quite a strong relationship which was formed quite quickly in a smallish number of tossed off scenes in a few episodes mm. which made that work surprisingly well when they then tugged on it for pathos in about two episodes of time but as i say everything happens relatively quickly in this show it is in its own way quite efficient i mean it's an eight episode british sitcom series i guess in some ways even though it, the episodes are slightly shorter than some of the british ones it it's basically a classic format in its way yeah they've kind of they've got a bit more money than the average british sitcom that mainly relies on one set and that they do do sort of like like outdoor photography they have special effects they have a few large crowd scenes so it's very much a, a sort of a British sitcom but with Amazon money which is not the same as US TV network money but it got a bit more a bit more shine to it yeah as I say I don't think my mind was quite blown by this but it was very enjoyable and I do I do hope they get that second season that they're clearly angling for based on the ending of this one at the end I was left very strongly thinking I would definitely watch the hell out of a, a second series of this. Yeah, and uh, I was really pleased with how it worked. I was, I don't know, I just it's a difficult thing to pull off comedy and horror together, making the horror believable and the comedy still funny. Also, like, I really got invested in the main characters. I really, you know, felt like I'd gone on a journey with them. And it's not phenomenal. It's not broken into my top five TV shows of the year so far. But I do give it a strong thumbs up. And especially if you're a fan of the sort of the Peg Frost school of genre mashing comedy then yeah I, I give this a big thumbs up yeah considering we have at times seen some disappointing things this year yeah no this is really good if you've got amazon then by all means give it a shot A 
Okay, second up today, we'll be talking about Blood of Zeus, apparently previously known as Gods and Heroes, a Netflix original anime series about a chap in the age of Greek mythology who discovers that he's actually the secret son of Zeus, and that because of this, various people want to kill both him and Zeus, and he is about to become caught in the middle of an epic struggle between gods, which, you know, bit of a bummer for that guy. This is an original anime series created by Charlie and Vlas. Parpanides, and apparently from the same studio who brought us Castlevania, which of course we did watch and like, even though it was written by someone who is now a tad problematic. So, Alistair, what did you think of this one? So, during the build-up to this show on social media, I saw people describing it as a sort of unsanitised version of Greek mythology, one with all the blood and fucking kept in, a sort of non disney version of Greek mythology, um, which is, I think, how I described it to you. Yes, so you did, I repeated it for the listeners at the end of last week's episode. Yeah, that's what I was have been led to believe. And well, there is blood in it, so uh and it's in the title, so obviously correct on that score. Not so much fucking, but that's not really what I found disappointing about this show. Thank God for that. What I found disappointing yeah. yeah, is like if we were gonna do a ten minute review about the lack of anime titties in this, then you could do it by yourself, mate. <laughs> Fair enough, it's like poor quality sex, D minus. <laughs> No, what I found quite disappointing about this was the lack of Greek mythology, or more specifically, why they didn't adapt a specific Greek myth for this. There's a lot of good ones out there. There's a lot of good stories that I think would work quite well as a sort of violent anime format. I mean, I'm sure someone out there has probably done one at some point. But for some reason, what they decided to go for instead of adapting specific stories from the vast canon of Greek myth, they kind of went for just a grab bag of different creatures, gods and concepts from Greek mythology, sort of mixed it all up together and shook it out into some fairly generic fantasy adventure. I mean, yeah, we've got a hero who's who's half god, his father there's use that's from greek mythology you know they throw in different sort of monsters and stuff like cerebus the three-headed dog which is from the hercules mythology that's in there but he's he's just in there just because they want a big monster at one point what i thought when i first heard about this is wow this has the potential to be an actual really interesting show about greek mythology something that could both be i don't know interesting and entertaining and it's kind of disappointing on all those fronts what we heard here is out of step padding desperately to explain why he didn't like it for reasons other than the lack of anime titties. No comment. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, don't get me wrong, I didn't like it either. I didn't really get to this far as thinking, oh, I don't like this because it isn't a pure enough bit of Greek mythology. I mean, you know, they've got their gimmick of it being a lost myth and okay, fine. But yeah, the fact that they've gone to the trouble of saying we're going to do a lost myth and the lost myth turns out to be a really generic random dude discovers he's special plods around a bit, meets some gods, builds to a generic fight scene. It's just a bit of a generic trudge, to be honest. It's very much the anime equivalent of a, I don't know, I don't quite want to say a Michael Bay movie, because honestly, again, because of the lack of blatant sexualization. But yeah, it's it felt like a bit of a generic blockbuster, to be honest. The animation is fine. Not so amazing, but it overwrites my need for better writing. But the animation is pretty good. There's some decent action scenes. There is, as Alistair said, some nice bits of blood. But the problem is that, yeah, the characters are largely two-dimensional ciphers, the hero especially. So yeah, for the, I think the third episode running i'm gonna have a gentle whine about dull protagonists for what it's worth yes atticus from lovecraft country you are more interesting than the lead character heaven from this who disappointingly is a man and not in fact a heaven <laughs> that would be that would be a different show probably a more interesting one yeah one of the main villains yeah his sort of rival villain chap gets a little bit more development and it's slightly more interesting and there's a couple of episodes where a large chunk of the running time is devoted to like backstory like filling in a myth like there's one about the birth of heaven and there's another about the birth of his brother and his son subsequent life and they're probably the best episodes because they sort of tell some little myth stories and it's actually quite watchable in a still slightly low-key way and then the rest of the time it cuts back to the present day narrative and i found it quite hard to concentrate to be honest yeah i mean i completely agree with you on the generic hero front i mean this is some of the most generic of generic heroes in that he's literally just a dude who gets a sword there's almost yeah the characterization is is completely flat in this show there's a bit in about three quarters of the way through where he he has to leave his training with the gods because my friends are in danger and i must help them it's like do you know those people okay i thought you only met them like twice but okay sure and also those the friends supporting characters have even less characterization than he does they're even more just generic people yeah one of them is i think the main female character well the main female hero character i guess uh, alexia who seems like she's going to be important in the first few episodes and then basically vanishes it's played by jessica henwick who was the mm. love interest in iron fist who's actually really good and I'm, I'm still looking forward to seeing her get you know a big new role to really showcase what she could do but this is not it yeah the, the whole characterization is just totally flat i mean there's a bit at the end 
gonna try and not spoil the end but it's it's not really worth it so but yeah there's a bit right at the end and obviously you get to the kind of bit when the character has to overcome you know show some emotional progress happens in a lot of things it's kind of a good way to wrap something up at the moment of climax of the plot the character must show some emotional growth and you know and personal development in order to achieve their external goals so an example is with the first thor movie in order to defeat the the big sort of metal colossus thing that's tearing up thor must stop being a a sort of a bold hero and he must step forward and try to sacrifice himself to save his friends and thus showing some humility and personal growth so they try to go for that but the characterization is so flat it just doesn't really work there's so something about how the character is supposed to be learning to control his rage but he's not particularly he doesn't have much of a personality so the fact he's supposed to have anger problems isn't really there in the story so this moment that's supposed to be a bit when he has a personal breakthrough to achieve something and win the day it just has something confused about anger there's a few slightly constipated angry expressions and then the the show kind of ends the characterization is not there when it needs it the most yeah i mean the gods might well be more interesting than the mortals or at least at least they have you know interesting visuals and they get to do big dramatic things rather than just stand there being a random dude but i don't know they don't really get much screen time except for maybe zeus and it just keeps cutting back to the main character so it's hard to get that invested i yeah maybe there's better anime out there there probably there must surely be better anime out there i did actually have a brief look and this has had much better reviews from people who aren't us so maybe we just don't get it maybe we just are not the anime my audience i don't know but whatever if you like greek mythology and are looking at this for your first experience of anime maybe don't watch it yeah i mean the gods thing was another thing that i sort of didn't like about that is that a lot of greek mythology is supposed to have like kind of the gods taking active roles and playing parts and doing things but obviously zeus is in it a fair amount but the only gods of any characters are zeus and his wife hera there's a little bit of poseidon and hermes pops up like i know a couple of times but to be honest almost all of the gods are just kind of there in the background as sort of decoration they're not there's supposed to be more gods in greek mythology also of all the female gods hera is the only one who has any speaking to do so yeah we don't hear anything from athena or aphrodite or any of the others they're just they're just there and when she does speak she's very much jealous woman yeah yeah hero is an angry jealous woman villain i don't think that's a big spoiler it's pretty clear from episode two and as i say the lead female mortal hero played by jessica henwick gets basically nothing to do at all in the entire series yeah so in summation ugh. yeah this is uh it's not some great step forward in terms of representation of of women in science fiction and fantasy yeah i mean obviously i'm not saying that all anime needs to be written by warren ellis because his recent problematic revelations aside there are other good writers who have distinctive voices but yeah what is definitely needed was some sort of distinctive dialogue voice to try and make the characters come alive a bit in the short space they had like the first series of castlevania was just like four episodes and it was basically just an extended action scene Mm. it was more or less just a movie that had been chopped up to be honest it was like half the length of this and i still got more of the characters from that than i do from this exactly yeah i think that because some time we've been spent in characterization and also building up the dynamic between the characters same as with true seekers they spend a lot of time investing in the dynamic between the three main characters building up on their relationship and then after you've established that you've got the audience invested in this team you can then go on a journey with these characters have them you know explore conspiracies and supernatural things like that or mythology but you kind of need that core group people need to be invested in the main characters and their journey or at least what they want and what they're about before you can kind of dive deep into the world or whatever and they don't really do the time of this to invest you in the characters again it feels like a chopped up movie but a really generic one with i guess maybe slightly too many characters in it for the amount of plot they also want to have in it yeah i don't know it's it's not great to be honest so yeah this does this family gets a and not recommended. Yeah, I fell asleep during the back half of one episode. I did then go back and rewatch it because, you know, I feel bad reviewing things when I haven't watched them properly. But yeah, that is about the level of investment I was at. In one of Mark Kiermaier's books, I think he, at one point he said that he felt that, like, sleep is a valid form of criticism, but drunken sleep is not. I was stone cold sober, and yeah, so I feel, I feel my, I probably did very much intend my snoozing critically. Yeah. I mean, if you're interested in Greek mythology and want to show this by Greek mythology, also don't watch this because it'll make you either disappointed or angry or both. There we go. I'm glad we liked Truth Seekers, otherwise this episode would have been a bit of a bummer.
Thanks for listening. If you have enjoyed this episode of Moderate Fantasy Violence, then please leave us a review in iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts as it helps other people find out about the show. You can also visit our website, moderatefantasyviolence.com, where you can listen to back issues of the podcast and read short written pieces by Nick and myself. And if you so wish, you could also follow us on social media. We're on Facebook if you search for Moderate Fantasy Violence or we're on Twitter at, at MFE Podcast, where you can read about Alastair's hashtag MFV Film of the Day if you want to know what film he's thinking about that day and meanwhile i've been nick bryant you can follow me on twitter as at nick mb and you can read my writing related thoughts of the day often or you can see more of my writing and assorted work at nickbryant.com i have been alistair ball if you want more from me then follow me on twitter where i'm at alistair jr ball or find more of my writing at redtrainblog.com join us next time when we will be discussing series two of the mandalorian and a new comic called red fork by Alex Pack Nadal and Neil Vendrill. See you then. Goodbye. Bye. Right. Some other TV shows in which some things happen? Yeah, sure, why not? Mm. I'd say that doesn't really narrow it down, but there are, of course, TV shows in which literally nothing happens. Yeah, the weather, for example. Large chunks of the Marvel Netflix shows.